Hi, everyone. Get ready for the How I Raised It podcast, the show where you get an unfiltered inside look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and today's episode is with Ofek Ron of Plantish, a startup based in Israel that is creating seafood that is not made from any fish. He talks about using his mission to attract people and then using people to attract capital. So it's a pretty interesting story. If you're tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, I've created a super valuable free welcome package for you. It includes a list of 2,500 investors who don't require a warm intro, plus 200 of the most important questions that investors are going to ask you. So this will help you get ready to rock your fundraise. To get instant access to this, click the link in the first comment. And while you're there, please leave us a nice comment about what you like about this show in general. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them. And then smash that like and subscribe button to get all our latest episodes. Thank you so much for being here. Sit back and enjoy the chat with Ofek. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Ofek Ron of Plantish coming to us from Tel Aviv. How's your day going there? Going good. Very hot, even though it's November. What is Plantish? Let's get into what you guys do. Cool. So basically, Plantish is a celebration of seafood, which is a new seafood. It's a seafood that came out of plants and not from fish. And Plantish is actually renovating the way we produce fish by a novel technology that enables us to create any kind of fish steak or filet, which has a very complex structure that our technology is allowing it, so uh, enabling it. So that's, in a nutshell, us uh, with the aim to save our ocean from industrial fishing. Okay, so what? So these are filets and other fish products what are they made of is it seaweed is it beans you know what are we what are we doing so here? definitely uh, seaweed uh, is a part of it because we need uh, we need it to have omega-3 like the original uh, fish mm. but we're also using soy and other uh, fat oils and basically the it's made from the same ingredients that you can find in impossible burger or beyond burger with modification because it's fish but it's not any new ingredients the only thing which is new is how we place it on you know on a 3d dimensions and um, structure which this is the technology that we're building so we're allowing new kind of products which are not just ground meat or fish but a whole cut and uh, yeah it, it, it's it's a podcast but i can show you <laughs> sure yeah <laughs> no, let's see it because we'll, we'll put this up on YouTube too, so, so some people can see it. Do you have a... So this is the plenty salmon. It looks just like salmon. However, it's made 100% from plants. It has high amount of protein and omega-3. It has no mercury, no antibiotics, and also no bycatch, no sustainability issues. And uh, not a single fish has to be dead for that. So... Mm-hmm. I see it as the future of food, and we we are happy to lead this, uh, you know, movement. For people just listening, not watching on YouTube, it does look just like your sort of perfect piece of salmon fillet. <laughs> um, Definitely. Okay, that's interesting. I was going to ask if you're going to be making different types of fish, and but obviously answers that. So, what is the technology you're combining? Seaweed, soy, other things, and you know, you said it's kind of how you're how you're. Yeah, so we're building a machine which is based on a 3D printing principles, but also some other technologies involved in there to make it more scalable. And um, and that's the mechanics we're building. And we're using existing ingredients and, you know, putting it in a formulation that will be nutritional and tasty. Yeah. But in the end, our main innovation is the mechanics that we're building. Interesting. So we're a food company that built the mechanic for itself, for itself, and which is kind kind of unique, but we're uh, but it works as you see. <laughs> yeah, we had um, we actually had redefined meat on the show like a while really? ago. You know them; they're doing printed steaks. 
Yeah. Yeah. So we're kind of doing the the same. Uh, this it's the same philosophy. Of course, each of us has has gotten differently the the, the machines. But uh, yeah, it's kind of the same uh, the same uh, approach. Uh, while they're uh, doing it on meat, and we're doing it on fish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. What? Where is this at in t- in terms of development? Is this something that's still in the lab? Is it in early customer trials? What? So that's still in the lab. Uh, of course, there are some investor trials. Otherwise, it will be hard to <laughs> to keep the momentum going. And we are. And pr- do, providing tasting to chefs and to and to people that uh, for getting feedback, but everything is still in our lab. So it's uh, we're still quite away from the market. Like I guess it will take additional two years of development till we can do something which is scalable enough to get in the market. Very interesting. And you know, being fully honest here, how does it taste? Like, does it really taste like salmon, or does it taste? Not quite like salmon, but still really good. I mean, I think of like the Beyond Burger. It's like, it still tastes really good. It doesn't really taste like a burger, but it still tastes really good. Like, how would you kind of rate your your Definitely product? not like salmon yet. If it would be like salmon, uh, it will take us less time to get into market because a lot of the, the innovation is also in the in the chemistry side. Um, so it's still not a salmon, definitely. Um, uh, but it looks like salmon already, as you can see, and it's tasty already. Mm-hmm. So it's tasty, but it's not a salmon. And now what we're trying to do is making it not just tasty, but tasty and more like 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 a, like a salmon. So I believe in a year from today, we will be in a place that we will feel that it's close enough to a salmon and we can put all the attention on the mechanics. Interesting. So where did this idea come from? What's your backstory? Uh, cool. uh, <laughs> so um, uh, basically I'm 30. I'm, uh, about 10 years ago, I was serving in the military service and I was exposed through some of the trainings to the animal industry, you know, walking by uh, the places that you see how the milk cow raised and and I just became vegan after a while because it was uh, I got exposed to things that I didn't want to see and didn't want to know. And when I realized what's going on, I understood that I cannot take part of eating any animal-based foods. And uh, after a while, I, I, it became like a mission to me. So when I finished uh, the army, I was one of the beginners of an NGO uh, called Vegan Friendly, which is one, the largest uh, animal rights uh, NGO in Israel today and also quite big in the UK. Hopefully in a year, it also will be big in the US. And it was my my passion, you know, to try to contribute um, uh, to the animals by raising awareness toward veganism and how good it is and uh, helping people to reduce meat and milk and other. And and it was very cool, but I, but I was uh, still uh, occupied with non-NGO activities. I was managing a company of, of software event production, and then it merged into a software company. And after a few years working and volunteering the same time at Vegan Friendly, I just decided to take everything away and go and work at Vegan Friendly. And when I worked there, I had a pretty low salary, but I was so thankful that I have a chance to do something meaningful. Mm-hmm. But what I was frustrated about is that there are no alternative to seafood. In Israel, there was nothing, zero. And in the US, it was, you know, a few hundred thousand of sales a year. So it's like nothing compared to a half a trillion markets of like fish and seafood. And uh, the, the thing about it is that it's not like meat, that you have burger and it's a huge market. Like if yep. you look at the fish burger market, it's nothing. Most of the fish consumed as fish, yep. as a whole cut. Yep. And uh, then I realized that we have to do it because otherwise people will just continue to eat fish and the ocean will be empty from seafood, <laughs> empty from, from everything in a few years, maybe tens of years, but still like we, we can eat the ocean by accident. And that's what's happening. We're eating the ocean today. So uh, I just understood that I need to do whatever I can to stop it. Mm-hmm. So I started Plantish. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. It's a, uh... Oh, you hear some of these statistics about how by, I think it's like 2050, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish or stuff like that. It's just dismaying and really depressing. (laughs) Um, What is uh, also concerning is that the plastics coming from mostly from 
fishing nets and fishing equipment. Mm. Most of the plastic in the ocean are not the straws that you have. It's not the plastics that yeah. you consume as an as, as like, individual. And that's a big deal, you know? So if we just stop eating fish, we're cleaning the ocean from plastics. Not only getting more fish, but getting a lot less plastic. It's like most of the plastics coming from there. Interesting. Yeah. I just purchased some, I'm going to give a plug to a different business for a second, but I just purchased some sunglasses from a, it's called the ocean cleanup, the ocean cleanup.com. And they're out there just gathering plastic and turning them into like sunglasses and they're kind of expensive, but like, I guess that's supporting supporting their continued efforts so check out the ocean cleanup.com if you're <laughs> we do. Into this. Um, interesting okay very cool now did you have how, you know what you're doing is complex on both kind of the chemistry and the i guess the physics or you know creating things that look like real real fish so did you have that talent did you find scientists to join you in this yes. company or what yeah. so uh, that's the thing so in the big like what most i think of the people think that like you you have to have let's say another founder that will be like the science guy if mm-hmm. i'm not a science guy and then with this science guy we can go and raise money but when you're doing something which is very very deep tech so there is not one scientist that can solve it okay mm-hmm. we have to solve it also in the chemistry level also in the biology level we have to understand the fish mm-hmm. also in the mechanics level also in the food level, so you have to have the best food engineer, the best biologist, the best chemist, the best mechanical engineer, the best process engineer. Like you have to have a team that this team, just with this team, you can do it. But with one guy, you cannot even get into a small prototype. So it's not like a regular startup. And I realized that. And, and it was very, very tough because I told myself, even if I get one guy, now I need to convince the investors that we as founders can get the others. And that would be very challenging. Mm-hmm. So uh, wh- what I did, I started to speak with like one angel and told him that I have another guy. And he's like, listen, it looks from your experience and what I told him about myself, that my strength is leadership, getting people on board. So if that's your uh, strength, go first do it and then raise the money. And I'm like, but how can I, you know, how? how? And once he told me, you know, just just do it. Like, just do it. Mm -hmm. If you can get those people, you can solve it, right? Yes. So go get the people. And then investors will see that you can get the people and you can solve it. Yeah. So so what I did was the opposite of most of the startup. I just understood that to solve this, this issue, we need more than one guy. And I had, it was me and a very strong biologist. Yeah. And. And it wasn't enough because we're building a machine. It's not just doing like a better fish burger. Maybe yeah. that would be enough to have a biologist, which is also a chemist, by the way, but mainly biologist. So uh, me and Ron um, just understood that that's what we need to do. So I continued to get more founders and and I got the best, you know, mechanical guy, the best chemist PhD, the best food engineer in Israel. And I got them before I had even how to pay them. So what I did, it was March, we registered a company, me and my first founder, and we told them, listen, this is your uh, contract. You're starting to work here from April. And in Israel, you have to pay um, uh, 10 days after the end of the month. So I understood that if I'm hiring them on April 1st, they have to get paid until my, na- May 9th. So I have about two months, it was March 8th, I have two months to figure out how I can get money. In. <laughs> by myself, it would be very hard because it's just me and my partner, which we lack of a lot of the, the knowledge need to do to, to create this crazy thing. But with them, we can do it. That's the guys we need. So, so I gave them the contracts and all of them, even my founder, everyone besides me, were protected. From April, you're going to get money. So they all left the jobs. And now all the pressure was on me. But with them, it was easier because I just came with this superstar team and like investors were very excited. First, mm-hmm. they were excited because of the team and second, because of my leadership, how I managed to get those people quit their job and join the venture. And that would help us to, to raise very fast $2 million. Like after one, and a, one, one month, we got about $320,000. Uh, and then like a few weeks after, we had a term sheet for $2 million. So... Hmm. 
So it was like so quick, but because I understood what's my strength. My strength is leadership to get the best people. So let's mm-hmm. first get the best people. And you know, the worst case scenario, I'm going to the bank, taking a loan, paying them another month and closing the company. That's the worst case. And I can live, you know. So uh, I took Did the you... risk and it, and it worked for me. Yeah, that's a big gamble. Did you, ha- so maybe you sort of address this, maybe it's because of Israeli law, but did you have to get them to leave their current businesses before you could go raise money? Or did you ever think about like, hey, getting their commitment, like letting them keep their jobs, but getting their commitment to leave once you raise? I mean, I guess, did the, did you have to get them to leave before you could go talk to investors? The yeah. thing is that when they leave, they have to give a notice of yeah. about a month. So what I told them, listen, now is March, I need you for uh, investor meetings. So I'll try to do it after your working times and stuff like this. And on March, they already worked. They came to the investor meeting. They helped me raise. And in April, like they already, you know, left their jobs and joined full time. And uh, I, I could tell them you can stay, but then I'm not serious. You know, I'm not serious. They still have a job. They're still not free for me. They're still with their head in the job. Sure. I don't think you can. And, and every investor coming with, you know, technical question, but how you will address this? And then if I don't have them, so we cannot address it. You know, we need them to sit in a room for a few minutes and for like a few days and to yeah. figure out some technical challenge that we didn't think about. Yeah, yeah, I, that makes sense. What was your, what do you think the secret was to getting these people to actually take a, take such a big gamble? Was it your, did they share your mission of, you know, Definitely. Being- so first thing is sharing the mission. So mm-hmm. each one of them really wanted to do something impactful. Okay, so... And my founder and my co-founder and the first one, Ron, is is a, is a vet. Okay, he's a vet, and he's like a vet for free almost. And he was working in the university doing stuff, but he was a vet for. He's like a really animal rights activist. Okay. He's just taking animals and taking care of them. And uh, Ariel is a vegan, and Ilash is vegetarian, and, and they're all very mission aligned. So that's the first thing. They were very excited of being working on something that they really passionate about and doing a real impact because all of them didn't been in, in such an impactful place before. Yeah. So they really felt that this is something that is for them. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I was very confident that I'm bringing the money. I told them, listen, you can leave the job. Here is the contract. You will get whatever you need. So uh, so like for them, it's like, you know, they trusted me of doing it. And uh, I trusted myself that I would do it with them. And then I reflected it to everyone who spoke with me. Like, guys, we're the hottest pre-seed startup in the world. We have the world-class team and we're going to do it because what we have is a huge market potential, mm-hmm. half a trillion dollar market, and we have the world-class team trying to solve it. So bet on us. Like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, I think that's that's interesting. And, and is the word chutzpah? I'm probably not even saying it right, but kind of having that sort of confidence to take that flyer when you, you know... <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't have the wings yet to jump off the cliff. I don't know. Right. Um, very interesting. Okay. So, so take us to the next step of sure. identifying investors fairly quickly. Like how did you know who to go after? How did you get them to listen to you? Cool. Blah, blah, blah. So first of all, I was consulting with other founders that are good. Okay. That are good. That are raising a lot. Very successful founder. Try like I try to find through net through my network to get to founders, not to investors, because founders are very helpful, and they and they don't want anything back. They just want to help. So when I go to founders, I try to understand how this how it works. And my strength is sales, marketing, business development. Like sales is my best part. I'm mm-hmm. a very good salesman, so I I knew I just need to learn how this investors world works to get into their heads. So I. I so they started to explain me how it works. Mm-hmm. And what I understood, I understood is a few things that others don't. First, don't go to pitch competition. If you go to pitch competition, it means I'm looking for money. But investors, they don't want someone that is looking for money. They want someone that all the investors want to invest in him and they want to co- compete on you. So you have to get on that position. And when you go to a pitch competition, you're telling them, hey guys, I'm raising money. Look at me, I'm cool. No. You're cool. You don't know to go to, to, to go to those uh, pitch events. You want them to go to, to pitch events and you will come as an attendee and they will then they will tell you why they're the best investor for you. Mm. So that's the mindset I, you have to understand when you raise money. Don't go to where other startups go because then you're just another startup. Mm-hmm. If you if you go to, to accelerator, 
go to the best one. If you go to, to you know, everything you do, you, you have, you have to, 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 to do what the best will do. And then, so, so that's something, again, I didn't go to any pitch competition. I was invited to 100, okay? So that's first. The second thing is uh, when I got to the first investors of probably uh, like what I have, I knew some investors that are not doing food tech. I asked them to recommend others on me. I asked founders to recommend their investors on me. And I started to get deal flow of investors. Mm-hmm. What I did was very, very simple. I spoke with the first investor. He told me, interesting, let's schedule another meeting. And when I scheduled another meeting, I turned, I, t- I, I took advantage of it because the next investor I spoke with, I told him, hey, everything good, but I just want to tell you that there is a very good investor that is interested is we're in a process, you know, never say something which is not true, but he's interested. If he wasn't interested, he wouldn't set another meeting with you. Is not, I didn't say he's investing, he's giving mm-hmm. a term sheet, never lie, but just take advantage of the situation. And the investor, okay, so you have investor that which is interested in you. Yeah, and he's working very fast. So if you wanna, like, if, if it's interesting for you, we need to work fast because it looks to me like you are relevant to us. Mm-hmm. But if you want it to happen, let's move quickly because I don't want to get a term sheet from him while you're just in the second meeting with me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, okay. So, and then he's scheduling faster the second meeting. And then the third investor, now I have two other investors that are interested in me. And then I'm calling the first investor, listen, the meeting is for next week, but other two investors came accidentally in and they're working very fast. And then you're making an, a whole new situation that everyone are in FOMO around you. Yeah. And I'm sure that it, and, 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 and you, did, you did it without saying anything which was not true, just taking advantage of the situation. And most of the founders are like doing a lot of code with a lot of investors, but the more you see, the less relevant you become. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I did it like number one, number two, number three, and then make them all like nervous that others are moving fast with me. So they're moving fast with me. And, and then suddenly, you know, you got the term sheet and then you like say no to the other and then they're starting to, you know, like be very offended and and all and all the situation is like the opposite like a month ago it was me now i have a team that i recruited now i'm starting reaching investors and i'm praying that anyone will 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 look at me and then after a few weeks they're all arguing why i'm not letting them in and why i'm letting them in and like the whole situation is changing in a few weeks yeah all you need to do is to manage it is to manage it in a smart way is to share with other investors that other investors are interested when, when they are. Did you give names of other investors or do you keep them? Um, yes, but uh, but when I gave the names, I was making sure that, like, for example, I had like an investor from Spain and nobody knows him here in Israel. So I can say his name and probably they won't find him, call him, hey, what you thought about Ofek? Because they're competing with him. Mm-hmm. If it's like two besties, yeah. And they're not very, very interested. So I won't tell because then they will speak one with each other and he will turn him down and he will turn him down. Right. Then in the rest, they, they can both be down. But yeah, if it's like someone from another country that they have no relationship, why not say the name? It will just give more credibility and they will not talk with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, no, I like that. I, I, I do a, a talk called Funding Hacks and I say that a lot where there's a direct correlation between the speed at which your round is moving and the likelihood you're going to be successful in raising <laughs> the round, right? The faster Definitely. you can make everything go, the, the more likely you're going to get what you want. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And what happened in the end, after all this, uh, after when, when I signed the term sheet and uh, got to call followers, I felt like I can bring any follower in the world because I had so much hype from other in- investors which we were interested so in the end, I found myself through an investor that wanted in, connecting me to a Michelin star chef in the U.S. called Jose Andre. You can Google, he's like one of the top chefs in the U.S. And after 10 minutes, he's in. Mm-hmm. So like, you, so the, 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 the interesting thing is that when you get a term sheet from a strong investor, and we got Tech Aviv, which is a very good investor in Israel, and now Yaron, the GP, is like my best friend. So when you get someone that is like, high level investor, you can get any follower in the world. You just have to believe in yourself. So I, I got Nest Daily, which is like a top blogger and this crazy chef. 
and other great uh, angels and food tech VCs, you can just choose. And most of the people are like, oh, I spoke with this investor first. So yeah, now when I'm closing the lead, I will call this investor that was interested. But who cares? Everyone is interested. Just think, who is the best for you? Is it Jennifer Lopez? Bring Jennifer Lopez. You know, she will come. You just have to get her. Yeah. After, you have the, after you have the lead signed, and if it's a good lead, you can get anyone. So just be more ambitious. So Tech Aviv it led the round, and then the yeah. rest was angels mostly? Angels, VCs, uh, like one VC and uh, one uh, nonprofit in the U.S., which is a sustainable ocean alliance, uh, a very mission-aligned NGO that I wanted them to, to be a part of it, and the rest is angels. Um. Was it a price round or a safe or an, a note? How so it started as a, as a safe. And after uh, I met with Tech Aviv, they asked, it, they asked that it will be a price round. And it was my first venture. I didn't know even what's the differences between safe and price round. And I really wanted them. So I told him, yeah, sure. And then I realized <laughs> I should go for a safe. But now, like when I'm looking back, it was good that it was a price round because it's like set the thing up, things yeah. up for me. And, and I chose good. So it's okay. But... Definitely, it was by mistake. <laughs> Interesting. I think I saw somewhere, I forget online or something, that there was some some really interesting angels like company builders, unicorn founders, any any names you can share? Like who are the most interesting uh, folks? So Tech Aviv is a, is a unicorn uh, uh, founding fund. So it's like uh, 30-something unicorn founders under one umbrella called Tech Aviv. So I have almost every unicorn in Israel. Um, 35 of them, which is most of the unicorn, I believe, they're there. And I have a WhatsApp group with them, and I can just send, connect me, please, to X and getting the connection. So it's very it's very cool. But beside them, yeah, I had uh, Gil Hirsch, which is a great founder and uh, CEO of Stream Elements, sold the company to Facebook in the past. Yeah, I have Tal, uh, which is the co-founder of Cloudinary, another unicorn. So I have a few more angels that are... Uh, I'm uh, invested directly, Oriel from Papaya Gaming, uh, gaming uh, unicorn. So a lot of uh, a lot of good uh, a lot of good uh, angels uh, came in. Cool. How many investors do you think you talked to total? Do you have a sense of your pipeline? Uh, and it was yeah. Start with that. <laughs> I think it was um, around uh, twenty five investors, something like this. Okay, pretty good. Cool. And I assume, I mean, the pitch is. I just got off a, a, a webinar I just did about like different pitch structures. I assume your pitch is mostly like vision and team, team and vision, you know, because you probably didn't have actual team vision and market is what you're pitching to these investors. Is that right? Um, yes, basically, yes. Uh, of course, uh, they they care about your tech um, vision, let's say, like they want to uh, t- to see a technical plan, like in general, what how, are we going to approach to the issue with which technologies and stuff like this? But, but both of you, us and them, they know that it will change, but they just want to see the thinking of the team. And what are you going to do in the next few months? How are we going to address this uh, challenge? I assume because you're a couple of years away from really hitting the market that you're going to have to raise multiple rounds. How are you kind of thinking about, you know, your total fundraising structure and next round, next round, you know, how are you thinking about that today? And like, um, in, you mean in terms of dilution, in terms of amount of capital? Just what amount of capital, yeah. Like planning ahead, right? You just raised, what was it, two? Two million? Two yes, million, right? I raised two million. And, um, so definitely we're going to raise a lot. And I can see from beyond any possible that both of them raised hundreds of millions before getting into an IPO and yes. impossible raised hundreds of million before even getting into the market. So I definitely see ourselves raising hundreds of millions. And uh, there is no question. Uh, if we're going to succeed, that's what we're going to raise. And, uh, and, and, and I believe... <laughs> That that's won't be the issue. The issue is will be to to solve the technical challenges and to have it taste like a salmon. The question yeah. you just asked me. And if we do it, we will raise whatever. Are you already starting to work on the next round? I know this this first round isn't that old, but are you already starting to? Do, and I what are you doing? That, so I think that founders are always working on the next round because that's a part of being a founder. You always working on the next round. So yeah, definitely. And uh, definitely we're working on the rest uh, on the next round. And uh, we aim to raise about $15 million on the next round 
still uh, calculating the exact amount that we will need, but uh, it's going to be a way larger round for sure. And uh, yeah, and after it, <laughs> a lot more than that. So, uh, <laughs> so what are you doing like today to work on the next round? Obviously figuring out how much you need, but what else, what else are you doing today? So I'm doing a newsletter for investors, each of the investors that was in touch with us and we had any interest working with him or her. So uh, we are putting them in a newsletter and every quarter, quarter uh, we send um, uh, updates and where we at and what, what's up. And if it's someone that is she or he is more interesting for us. So we also do monthly follow-ups, you know, just sending uh, some, some uh, sharing some things and like letting him, letting him or her know what's up. Um, I think it's a must because um, that's the way that you can actually maintain the relationship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, sure. Yeah. So the quarterly newsletter, monthly follow-ups for kind of your special list. And what's that? Just a little bit more information about like technical progress and stuff or, or what else? Yeah. Technical progress, hires, um, sure. pictures, those kind yeah. of stuff. Um, uh, and it works like I getting back a lot of good feedbacks and that helped me to like, the newsletter I send to, I don't know, maybe 50 investors that in total that I spoke since we started the company. And like you see, 10 of them are just responding right away. Great job. Amazing. And you know, those guys are like the easy ones on the next round. So they're already listed somewhere. And I know that I will go for them first to get more traction in the next round. Would you think about going or targeting large you know, food manufacturers, seafood manufacturers, or even entities like Impossible Burger as investors? <coughs> are those relevant investors for you? I think they are. I think it's not a time for us. Now we're building a company and we need to work with company builders. And company builders are usually good VCs that are investing in early stages. And that's what we need now. But in later stages, definitely we are going to consider some corporate VCs, corporates in general. And uh, anyone that we think that it, it can will be helpful for us. So definitely. Yeah, good. Cool. I won't keep you much longer. Um, what's your best uh, bit of advice or other tips we haven't covered for, you know, founders, maybe in the food space, maybe Israeli founders, whatever you want to do. What, what, what have we not covered that you can share? I think that's uh, doing like investing in the story and in putting it on a very nice and designed deck. Yep. is so crucial and when i'm helping other founders to raise and by the by the way like i i was I mean, um, connecting nine investments since i founded plentish which is like a lot but and what i found is that people are not investing in design and i see decks which are not nice and the story is not like like someone made a training on it and it's like trying to and say it like differently on every on every call and it's very easy. You just invest few hour, few hours and not a lot of money in design and you can raise additional few millions. <laughs> like it's, it's yeah, right. such a small investment to, to get a lot more chances to close the round quickly in higher valuation just on this small thing. So when I see the founder not doing it, it's like ridiculous. Come on, pay a designer like this few hundred, few hundred dollars and go to a friend and do the story 20 times and then you can say it by heart that's yeah. all yeah <laughs> totally it, agree you know? <laughs> uh cool 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 all right if people want to learn more i mean i don't think your website has too much information yet plantish.com right um is there any other place so they can there learn is a lot of information and now you going to be the only place that i can tell people that if you go there is a small button in the bottom of the website there is access user and then if you do a password which is save the ocean with small letters you can see a whole new website which is amazing and it's only for your audience because uh, we open it only for uh, special investors and now also for founders uh, sweet uh, <laughs> you know listeners cool i'll check that out save the ocean look for a small button on plantish.com to see to see more anything you want to promote or plug or you know hiring or anything you want to like call to action at all the call to action is guys go do what you're passionate about all the rest is bullshit work with your passion and good things will come that's it yeah good i like it sage 
wise words. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much. Good. You're doing good work. Thank you so <laughs> much. Our oceans. I think that's really important. I'm a sailor. I'm a real ocean guy. So this is important to me. I like it. Um, and uh, carry on. We look forward to seeing you on the next next one. Next round. Thank you. Me right. too. Thanks, <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.